Hello everyone and welcome back. This video is going to cover the process of soldering this PCB. I designed these PCBs with KiCad and they were printed and sponsored by PCBWay. Without wasting any more time, let's get right into it because this is going to be a long one. The design is based on the IS31FL3236A from Lumisi. This part is an LED driver that has 36 outputs and can drive each LED with up to 38 milliamps of current. For the LEDs, I picked the cheapest 0805 LEDs that I could find. These ones in particular are the VAOL-S8GT4 from VCC Optoelectronics. One of the soldering irons that I'll be using today is the TS-100. My TS-100 came with an AC wall adapter that plugs into the barrel jack on the back of the soldering iron. One thing to keep in mind when using the AC wall adapter is that the supplied grounding strap must be used, otherwise the tip will be at an AC voltage, uh, in this case, of around 40 volts AC. Here I connect the banana jack to a terminal connected to my ESD mats. The other hole is used for an ESD wrist strap. This is all important to do to prevent exposing the sensitive electronic components from ESD. I plan to solder all of these 36 LEDs by hand using the dual iron soldering method, which we'll get to later, and the QFN in the middle I'll try to solder with solder paste and hot air from my hot air rework station. One thing that I didn't realize is that the center ground pad is actually connected to the two ground pins on the package. In future updates to this decal, I will remove the solder mask in these spots to uh, make a better connection for the part. Soldering with solder paste is always a lot easier if you have stencils. I didn't really think ahead to get stencils and it's something I've never done before so I just like to solder by hand and here I am putting solder paste down trying to spread it out evenly so that there's enough solder to solder every pin and hopefully not cause too many shorts. Now I'm getting ready to put the part down. I'll put a little bit more liquid flux on here just because the solder paste seemed a little dry. I set the air speed to max and the air temperature to 380 degrees Celsius. And I started to slowly heat up the board, but uh, as you'll see, I heated it up a little too fast. Houston, we have liftoff. So here's try number two. I didn't put any more solder down, but I'm gonna put some uh, rosin flux in strategic spots around the board. So that will hopefully uh, give a little bit more stick. Uh, the solder, or sorry, the rosin flux is usually very tacky. So the goal here is to have it flow under the part and kind of hold it down as I heat it up and this result was much more successful than the first. And 
the goal with reflowing parts with hot air is to heat up the surrounding area of the board uh, at the same time that you're heating up the part so that everything kind of reaches the melting temperature of the solder at the same point uh, at which point it will melt and the surface tension should hopefully pull the part into the exact place that it needs to be. You'll see when the solder initially melts, the part is still not centered on the pads until I give it a little bit more to melt the ground pad underneath and then it pulls itself right into place. I can already see a few pins that are shorted together, but this is easy enough to fix. I use a fine point soldering iron and a lot of flux, and just by rubbing the iron across the pins, any extra solder will wick onto the iron, and then I can clean it off and just keep putting a clean iron down, picking up a little bit of solder every time until all the shorts are gone. I'm just doing a quick inspection of the solder joints after I've cleaned them up uh, one or two times and they're all looking pretty good. Well, they almost all look good. I'll clean this up quick. Next I'm getting ready to hand place all of the LEDs and first I start by tinning all the pads with a bit of solder after putting some flux down. And then I put each LED into the approximate location that it's going to be. And this would have been a lot easier if I had arranged them all beforehand. But here I am trying very delicately to place the LEDs and just having a really great time overall. With LEDs, one important thing to remember is that you want to make sure you have them facing the right direction. Uh, an LED is, like the name says, a light emitting diode. And diodes only conduct, or they should conduct, current in one direction. And so in this case, the green line denotes the cathode, or the negative terminal of the diode. So I have that facing towards the LED driver because the LED driver will pull it down to a voltage lower than the VCC voltage to have a current conduct across the LEDs in this case. So now I'm getting ready to solder the LEDs since they've all been placed down. So I'm putting some more no clean liquid flux on them and then I'm going to uh, use the dual iron soldering method to solder these LEDs, which usually goes a lot better than this. There's many reasons why this is less than ideal. The, the first one is that I'm using a big chisel tip iron on the right iron, and usually for this I would have a uh, much finer point iron, even finer than the other finer point iron uh, on the left hand side. Uh, and this is just what I happen to have, and I couldn't uh, be bothered, I guess, to look for the finer points. I, I do have some, I just, uh, I guess, was very lazy this time. Uh, but anyway, here I am uh, soldering. Basically, the, the way that the soldering, the soldering method works is you touch both ends, both solder pads that you already have solder on at the same time, and with enough flux around, if you heat everything up at the same time and let go, the solder tension will just pull the LED uh, or whatever surface mount device that you're soldering just right into place. And you usually don't have to do too much. Besides when things like this happen, uh, sometimes you run into some issues, LEDs jump around. Uh, overall, this usually goes very quick, but I struggled a lot. And the other reason why this was less than ideal is because I was standing up while soldering, and usually I will solder while sitting down. So my arms weren't supported, uh, everything was very shaky, but uh, we managed to get it done. So 
sometimes you have uh, things like this happen, uh, which is where the pad didn't have enough solder onto it, so the LED just would not stick. And I had the heat on the, the LED for longer than I felt comfortable, so I ended up throwing that one away. Put some more solder down, and then I got a fresh LED and tried again, and had much better luck the second time. After all the LEDs are soldered, I'm just going to go back over them again since I, there's no risk of knocking them around since they're all held into place. And I'm going to clean up every solder joint, rearrange them just a little bit better so they're all slightly more centered together, and uh, make sure that I have a good connection on every LED. And to make sure that every LED does have a good connection, I will go back over each LED with one iron and uh, some solder and just make sure they're all connected very securely. Next I move on to the other surface mount components on the board. There are two bypass capacitors. Both of these are listed in the datasheet as being required for this part. These resistors are for the I2C communication. R10 and R11 are the pull-ups on the I2C lines. For this design, I used 2.2K ohms for the pull-ups, simply because that's what I had on hand. R12 and R13 are zero ohm resistors that just act as jumpers. Just in case I need to disconnect or solder a wire, or if I messed up things so badly that I swapped SDA and SCL for the I2C communication, I can easily jumper wires across to fix that if needed. Moving to the back side, there's three more components to solder. R7 needs to be soldered to set the current. R1 is the enable resistor and I need to select a resistor for the I2C address. Uh, and here I'll pick the first one, I'll just pick R3, and which will set the address to hexadecimal 7C. For R7, I'm using a 4.7K ohm resistor, and as I put on the board here in silkscreen, 4.7K will get me 16.2 milliamps uh, as the maximum drive current per LED. Soldering these is the same as the other parts where I've tinned the pads and put the parts down and then using two irons just touch each side uh, and hopefully they, they go into place but I was having some issues with these parts on the back side for some reason. As you can see this does not look good. I'm going to put some of the tacky rosin flux on here. Uh, and hopefully this will work a lot better. The rosin flux sticks around a lot longer than the no clean liquid flux that I have, so hopefully that will be exactly what these resistors need to get soldered down. Oh yeah, that's it. That's what I'm talking about. Uh-huh. Yep. Uh, maybe. 
Something's something's wrong with this part. Can't quite say. I'll just clean up the board real quick and give it a once over here. And I think these all look pretty good. Except, oh my god. What the heck is that? Okay, uh, I'm just going to pretend I didn't see that. And move to the front side and clean everything up here. Make sure it's all defluxed. Looking pretty good. The last parts I need to solder are the through hole headers that allow this board to plug into a breadboard. To do this, I first put some 10th inch headers into my breadboard, evenly spaced so that the board would fit on top of it, and just pressed it right down. Then while holding the board in place, I put some flux down to help the pin solder, and tinned my iron, and touched the tinned iron to one pin on each header to hold it in place. Then I came back and soldered the other pins and touched up the first pins just to make sure that there was a good connection on all the pins. And that's it, the soldering's all done. So the next step is to plug it into the breadboard and see if it works. I'm using an Arduino Nano to drive the LED board. It's pretty simple to connect them, it's just the A5 pin, which is SCL, and the A4 pin, SDA, and that's all you need for I2C. For power I'm using a breadboard USB adapter and have it connected to a battery pack. The manufacturer actually had Arduino code for a similar part that also worked on this part. All I had to do was change some of the registers around and it worked. The first thing that I noticed was that one of the LEDs wasn't turning on. My initial suspicion was the LED was bad. But it turns out uh, there was an open solder joint on the QFN. I touched up the joint with a little bit of solder and all the LEDs were on. I have some pretty interesting ideas for this part and I plan to use it for some upcoming projects. If you're interested in what I'm going to be doing, stick around. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Till next time.